This podcast is brought to you by Mormon Stories Podcast and by the Open Stories Foundation. To learn more, check out ldshomosexuality.com. Now let us rejoice in the day of salvation. No longer as strangers on earth need we roam. It's a pleasure to welcome you to this historic conference on behalf of Mormon Stories and the Open Stories Foundation. My name is Joseph Broom, and I've been asked to conduct this first general session of this conference. One year ago, I could not have imagined me standing before you as an openly gay man. Many of you know that I began the process of coming out a little over a year ago and began blogging as Invictus Pilgrim. At that time, I was absolutely paranoid about anyone finding out my true identity. Today, however, I'm proud to stand before you as a man who, after 27 years of membership in the church and 24 years of marriage, came to a point in my life when, as Bill Bradshaw so eloquently described yesterday, I was dramatically, unexpectedly confronted with my truth and knew that I could no longer live a lie. This past year has been full of many twists and turns, ups and downs, and new and varied experiences. It has also been a year in which I've made more friends and met more new and interesting people than at any time in my life. One of those interesting people who became a good friend is John DeLynn, the founder of Mormon Stories. This conference had its inception last July in a restaurant in Brigham City where a friend and I were having lunch with John. We were discussing various issues facing gay Mormons when John smiled and said, wouldn't it be cool to have a gay Mormon stories conference? So having attended the June Mormon stories conference here in Salt Lake City, I was enthusiastic and offered to help organize it. It is due to John's vision and the hard work of many people that we are able to sit here today. We want to specifically recognize Ann Peffer and Jared Anderson with Mormon Stories and thank them for all their hard work. We also want to thank Alan Miller, who organized tomorrow morning's interfaith service to be held in Skaggs Chapel, which is just down this hall, at 11.30 tomorrow morning. We hope that many, if not all of you, will be able to come to that. Special thanks are also extended to those who've arranged and are providing music for today's sessions, to the members of the conference chorus who will sing, to David Zabriskie for directing them, and to uh, uh, Mark Packer for helping organize the chorus, and to Mark, Tyler Kofit, and Devin O'Donnell for sharing their talents with us this afternoon, and to David Naylor for accompanying them. We also want to thank Jeffrey Blackmer for creating the illustration that's on the front of the program. Um, unfortunately, we neglected to give him credit for that in the program, so I wanted to specifically take just a couple of minutes and ask you to turn to that. And uh, as I explain in Jeffrey's words, the symbolism that he incorporated into this illustration. First of all, the violin symbolizes not only the musical talent and appreciation we have learned and in some cases grown up with as members of the church, it's also a nod to the abundant creative talent in the gay LDS community. The young woman is holding a Book of Mormon to symbolize our faith in the gospel and also our deep intimate knowledge of the scriptures due to searching for answers to our particular plight and guidance on how to conduct our lives after having come come out. The next young man is holding a seed bag and trowel, which is a nod to the old Joseph Smith reel to reel where he's sowing on his father's farm and has that epiphany. It also symbolizes sowing the seeds of understanding, which is really what this conference is all about. Finally, the the last young man is holding harvested wheat, which is a symbol of the hard work of our predecessors and the hard work yet to come in our struggle for acceptance and understanding in our community. We're also grateful to the panelists and presenters in the breakout sessions listed in your programs and to our speakers, Carolyn Pearson, Lee Beckstead, and Jimmy Creech, 
Sister Pearson's books are on sale up in Keck Hall, along with books uh, by Emily Pearson and Brent Kirby. And from 12 to 1.30, uh, Jimmy Creech's book, Adam's Gift, will also be on sale, and Jimmy will be on hand to autograph copies, I believe. Though Jimmy will not be speaking until this afternoon, he will be conducting one of this morning's breakout sessions as described in the program. And just as a side note, we're especially grateful to, to Jimmy for traveling all the way from North Carolina to be here. Uh, Jimmy's not LDS, he's a former United Methodist minister who feels passionately and is a pioneer in seeking equality within the general Christian community for members of the LGBT community. And we're grateful he's here. Lastly, we also want to thank all the various LGBT community organizations that are represented up in Keck Hall, which is upstairs at the north end of the building. And we encourage you to visit with them during the morning and afternoon breaks, as well as during the lunch break. Before we go on, there was a camera left at uh, McGillis School last night um, if someone wants to claim this, I will have it. This morning's general session will open with a prayer offered by Ann Peffer, after which I will read the statement of purpose for the conference. Dear God in heaven, so thankful that we can be here today and we can be here in hopes of being together and finding love and peace and sharing our authentic selves with one another and we are thankful that there are so many who are supportive of the needs of the LGBT same-sex attracted Mormons and that we have this opportunity to speak to many others who aren't here as well and let many know that they are not alone and that there are resources and love and that there's companionship and support available. We Say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Just before I read the statement of purpose, just a program note. Um, I'll just go over the uh, breakout sessions quickly so I don't have to do it later. Um, after this general session, there'll be a 30-minute break, and then we'll have uh, the breakout sessions that are listed in the program. Most of those will be on this main level, and I believe there's one upstairs. Uh, in this room, there will be a panel, and in addition to the names in the program is that of Catherine Stephenson, who will be representing Family Fellowship. So if you turn to the back of your program, you'll find the statement of purpose that was written by um, Joanna Brooks and others uh, to express the purpose of this conference. The goal of the Mormon Story Circling the Wagons Conference is to create a space where LGBTQ or SSA, SGA individuals and their families and allies can gather together to acknowledge, explore, and honor shared experiences. No issues strike more deeply than who we love and how we understand and honor God. These issues carry an especially profound weight in Mormon communities and have been the source of a great deal of misunderstanding, judgment, and hurt. Consequently, gay Mormons are deeply divided over how to address same-sex attraction and negotiate the choices they face. In convening this conference, we are inviting LGBTQ Mormons and their families and allies to step beyond historic divisions to establish a shared space where all who have ever self-identified as Mormon and have experienced same-sex attraction can speak truthfully and respectfully. Mormon Stories and the Open Stories Foundation are hosting this conference as an expression 
of our long-standing commitment to LGBTQ issues and in the spirit of our shared values as follows. We acknowledge the richness of Mormon heritage, teachings, and community in all of its diversity. We believe that one can self-identify as Mormon based on one's genealogy, upbringing, beliefs, relationships, and other life experiences, regardless of one's adherence or non-adherence to the teachings or doctrines of any religious organization. We seek spaces where we as Mormons can live lives of intellectual and spiritual integrity, individual conscience, and personal dignity. We acknowledge and honor different spiritual paths and modes of religious or non-religious truth-seeking. We respect the convictions of those who subscribe to ideas and beliefs that differ from our own. We recognize the confusion, distress, emotional trauma, social ostracism that people on faith journeys often experience. We seek constructive ways of helping and supporting people regardless of their ultimate decisions regarding church affiliation or activity. We affirm the inherent and equal worth of all human beings. Seek spaces where Mormons and all people can interact as equals, regardless of race, gender, or sexual orientation. In this spirit of egalitarianism, we prefer non-authoritarian and non-hierarchical means of organization and affiliation. We welcome all who wish to participate in a spirit of fellowship and openness with condemnation for none and compassion for all, in the hopes that all will experience personal renewal and discover a basis for common ground in our shared heritage. Our first speaker this morning will be my noted Salt Lake therapist, Lee Beckstead. He will be followed by the world premiere performed by the conference chorus of a new composition by David Zabriskie of a poem written by Carolyn Pearson, Pioneers. Carol Lynn Pearson will then address us, and after her remarks, we'll have a 30-minute break, as noted in the program. Once again, thank you for being here. Brother Beckstead. I am honored to be among this crowd. I do not know most of you, but I would bet that you have been tested and tried. You've had to make difficult decisions, maybe even wrestle with deciding to be at this conference today, regardless of the snow. You have had to search your souls and risk leaving familiar territories of beliefs and risk important relationships so that you could find new understanding and stand for your truth. Many of you have been alone in this struggle so I'm glad you've been able to find safe spaces, kindred spirits, and to use Carolyn Pearson's analogy, find other pioneers to join you on this trek. All this reminds me of something I heard last week about Eve in the Bible, who it seems also chose to do something that seemed to separate her from God in order to obtain more knowledge. And Adam, probably not wanting to leave Eve, also consciously made a choice. This act brought hardship, but also gave them more ability to progress and mature. And God was with them all the time. I know it is very difficult to go it alone, but I also know that it can be very important as a means of really knowing who you are and really knowing what life is about. Because of this, LGBTQ, SSA, Mormons, and their families and allies truly seem to be more capable of seeing life, seeing others, and seeing themselves with more complexity, more compassion, because of these conflicts within themselves and with the status quo. 
As a psychologist, it is important for me to recognize, though, how historically mental health professionals have got it wrong. We have viewed homosexuality through lenses of, that are very restricted, um, lenses of disease and immaturity. We have spent decades trying to find the cause of homosexuality so that we could cure it. These um, causes, these cures, have ranged from the benign or the ludicrous, such as teaching male homosexuals how to play sports or teaching lesbians how to wear makeup, to such cruel methods such as lobotomies, castrations, clitorectomies, and electrocuting them so that they could, would become more averse to what they desired. Many sexual and gender minorities have signed up for these methods because they saw themselves as the problem that needed to be fixed. It makes sense that many of us have taken on the responsibility to try to change ourselves in order to fit in. This gives us a sense of control and a sense of purpose by blaming ourselves for being different. It gives us a sense of purpose to try to make things better. But this agenda will ultimately damage the person through failure, through shame, anxiety, and depression. The solution of trying to fix homosexuality becomes the problem. Biases and stereotypes have ruled our understanding of homosexuality, bisexuality, and transgender issues. This means that you have been given a problem to solve without the right information, with the wrong information. And probably you've been given this problem to solve without the space or freedom to solve it adequately or creatively. The analogy I like to use is the blind men and the elephant. As the fable goes, a group of individuals in the dark or in the blind who have never seen an elephant come upon an elephant. And each um, touch one particular area of the elephant. One is touching the tusk, one is touching the ear, one is touching the tail, another is touching the side. And none can comprehend this big animal because they are too confident in their own perception and they argue with each other about what is an elephant. It all depends which part of the elephant you are holding and the lens you are viewing and interpreting that piece of the elephant. For sexual and religious conflicts, some are, are holding on and saying homosexuality is an addiction. Change is possible. Some are saying religion is important. Some say, no, you have to get rid of your religion. Some say you have to come out. Some say this is what the gay lifestyle is. Views can become myopic. They become fragmented, polarized, dissociative, and side-taking is reinforced. Claims are unjustified, unbalanced, and misleading. This blind man and the elephant story became clearer to me about 13 years ago, and really about four years ago, when I began talking with those who I considered my enemy, and I later found out that they considered me the enemy. I began to talk with proponents of reparative therapy. I found that many of them were most afraid of not being validated for their re religious beliefs. They were concerned about not being heard and spent their time validating their perspective, as those on the other side were, of the gay affirmative side were validating their perspective. Those caught in the middle of these debates seemed to be the ones who suffered the most because of these incomplete solutions. The problem is the options tend to be choose a gay identity or remain religious get off the fence and decide which way to go. Well, as many of you, of you know, those choices keep the person stuck because the two choices are actually, again, part of the problem. Despite the scriptural message, a person cannot cut off a part of themselves without causing harm. Even if it is to please God, your parents, or your community, Mental health and well-being seem to involve becoming whole, integrated, and expansive. From my work in this area, I learned that what we need to solve this problem is a more comprehensive approach, one that takes into consideration all aspects of the problem and take the best parts of all the aspects and avoid the parts that are harmful or inaccurate. However, it's as if we're trying to put a, together a big puzzle without all the puzzle pieces. We don't know the full story. There are many unknowns, many ambiguities regarding sexuality and spirituality. We are unable to see the full picture, yet many are obsessed with trying to 
put the puzzle together with what, what the pieces that they have um, and frustrated with themselves and others that they should be able to make it work with these puzzle pieces. However, as always with this topic, it's more complex than what people think. I was on the American Psychological Association Task Force to decide and evaluate what, um, what psychological interventions we should do for those who are trying to change their sexual orientation. And the recommendation we made on this task force was that our best efforts are not in trying to change inherent aspects of sexuality or in trying to change religion, but in trying to reduce the misunderstanding, the hostility, the discrimination that exists within the individual and within their social situations. From my own personal and professional involvement experiences, I have come to learn that what matters most is love. I know that sounds very cliche, but it does make sense that love would be the answer. Now, I think many of you, if not all of you, have needed to reevaluate your understanding of what love is. It is not submission. It is not trying to shame someone into changing. It is not suppression or denial. Love seems to involve an openness, attentiveness, tentativeness, a humility, and a curiosity that allow us to connect with ourselves and connect with others through deep acceptance and, and understanding. This process of connection and acceptance can involve into learning more about who you are and loving yourself for it but also include becoming more compassionate and forgiving toward those who cannot understand you. People need love to grow. And this is the same for sexual and gender minorities who are LDS and Mormon, and definitely their families and allies. But love without power is ineffective. Those who are loving but do not have power tend to try to please everyone, but lose their identity and their life energy. Inevitably, those who love without power try hard to make an effect, but end up feeling demoralized, frustrated, a failure, and hopeless. Power can come in many forms. For example, permission. Permission is powerful, the ability to explore and examine your truth, and then know what your truth is, and then power to act on that truth especially knowing what you yourself need to thrive. Power can come from a parent standing up to protect their child, or developing the inner strength to face discrimination when you are left alone. Power can come through obtaining accurate information and learning new skills. These skills could include learning how to live positively as a minority, learning how to grieve and accept reality, and then learning how to adapt to reality. Or power can come from learning how to relate more effectively with your feelings, rather than hating them, fearing them, but loving them. Being able to face conflict with confidence is definitely a skill to learn. Regarding my own personal path and resolution of my distress for being both gay and Mormon, I had a very difficult time. However, it came down to figuring out what was right for me. I had to learn for myself if homosexuality and the way I experience it and the way I express it was evil. And I had to learn more about what spirituality and religion meant for me. Because of this exploration and this self-knowledge, I chose the path I did, and I continue to choose it. We all need to find our, our own individual path of what makes us happy and what helps us to grow. My resolution will not be your resolution, and we are all too diverse for that. If the overarching purpose of life is to seek truth and remain open to more of it, then I hope that you all continue to keep exploring for yourself what truth is, and then you will know more about what is right for you, and happiness should come after that which I think the purpose of exploring truth for oneself is the focus and value of this Mormon Stories, Open Stories Conference. So thank you for letting me be a part of it.
I have been asked to read to you the poem that I wrote, which is the text that has been uh, created by David Zabriskie and will be sung by these folks. This is a poem called Pioneers. My people were Mormon pioneers. Is the blood still good? Truth flew by like a dove and dropped a feather in the west. Where truth flies, you follow, if you are a pioneer. I have searched the skies, and now and then another feather has fallen. I have packed the hand cart again, packed it with the precious things and thrown away the rest. I will sing by the fire at night, out there on uncharted ground, where I am my own captain of tens, where I blow the bugle, bring myself to morning prayer map out the miles and never know when or where or if at all I will finally say this is the place I face the plains on a good day for walking the sun rises and the mist clears I will be all right my people were Mormon pioneers. People were Mormon pioneers. Is the blood still good? They stood in awe as truth flew by like a dove and dropped a feather in the west. Where truth flies, you follow. Where truth flies, you follow. If you are a the plains on a good day for walking on a good day I face the plains the sun rises 
clears and the mist clears, the mist clears at the sun rising, I will be all right. I will be all right. I will be all right. My people were Mormon pioneers. Thank you so very much for that thrilling experience. Very, very beautiful. Thank you. It really is great to be here with you. I appreciate the invitation. I appreciate being here with all of the other good people who have so much to share with you. I appreciate Lee's words. And I'm grateful to have Brother Creech here. Jimmy, we like to call people brother and sister. You know that. I told Jimmy last night that uh, my good gay friend Mario presented me with two copies of his book, Adam's Gift. So this is a very important book. This one copy for you, one copy for you to give to your state presidency which I did indeed give it to them, and I read my own, and it is certainly an inspiring story, and I recommend it to all of you. So it snowed this morning, and I know I'm really in Utah. As you see, I had to kill a muskrat on the way in here. <laughs> I lied. My brother killed the muskrat for me. Thank you, Donald. As I was considering from all of the many things I might wish to share with you today, I was really overcome with the vast difference there is between when I was first invited on this journey through my marriage to my gay husband, to where we are now. And I know all of you should be in awe of that very thing. Who would have thought that today we'd be having serious conversations about gay marriage? Who would have thought we could have had conferences like this? And I was remembering, and I mentioned this toward the end of Goodbye, I Love You, when um, when my former husband, Gerald, was in the last days of his life in, in my home in Walnut Creek, California. Uh, he was asleep on one couch, and I was asleep on another couch. And I woke in the middle of the night hearing him say, come on, come on, come on. And I went over and asked what was happening. He felt that he was in the audience of La Caja Faux. The, um, the musical was coming to San Francisco, and with some of the last of his money, Gerald had purchased one ticket for himself. And that was the first time, of course, in musical theater history that there was a love song between two men. 
and that was an unheard of kind of thing. And that was something Gerald so was looking forward to. And I went and I put on the record of La Caja Fall. And as perhaps you know, there's that wonderful, wonderful love song, Song on the Sand. Through the crash of the waves, I could tell that the words were romantic, something about sharing, something about always. Well, the curtain never went up for Gerald. It didn't go up for most people in the 1980s. Those were very difficult times. And the times are so much different today that I hope that, they're, that is appreciated by all of you who are here. And I thought, okay, so today the curtain is up, and all of you gay folk are invited to be the star of your own show. And not only that, you get to be the playwright. Now that's a monumental thing. And so I've been thinking, what, what would be the story that a gay person would want to write out for his or her life story here. And of course I thought, well, we all want to be the hero of our own story, of course. Mm, hero, I started to think about that word. What does the word hero entail? And so I got out my Joseph Campbell. You all know Joseph Campbell, our major preeminent mythologist. We can call him Brother Campbell if we wish. So Brother Campbell and I have spent a lot of time these last several weeks creating a message for all of you, which we are entitling The Hero's Journey of the Homosexual Mormon. And it may be that you've not heard the word hero used in terms of who you are, but it's about time, is it not? And I would like to go through, firstly, the steps of the hero's journey, as Joseph Campbell has outlined for, uh, them for us, and then look at them with, in more detail. So very quickly, see if you can spot yourself anywhere along this journey. One, the ordinary world. Two, call to adventure. Three, refusal of the call. Four, meeting with the mentor. Five, crossing the threshold. Six, tests, allies, enemies. Seven, approach to the inmost cave. Eight, the supreme ordeal. Nine, reward. Ten, the road back. Eleven, resurrection. Twelve, return with the elixir. Okay, what is the elixir? That is our final reward here. It is that thing defined as a, a substance believed to be able to cure all ills. So that's what we're after. You know, there's a way in which we're all on a hero's journey. Some of you will remember my little play, My Turn on Earth. Barbara and her friends, safely up in heaven, the ordinary world for them, called to adventure, got to go down to earth. Oh, I don't want to. Oh, you have to. You got to go find the treasure that makes the Heavenly Father and Mother what they are. Oh, all right. This is the gay person's heroic journey. And the parent or the friend or ally can adapt this to your own self. And we won't all have the exact same destination. It will look different for various of us. But I'm suggesting that if we find the elixir, we will feel somewhat the same because the elixir is something that universally feels the same to all of us. So here is the step one, the ordinary world of the Mormon homosexual. You all remember that safely in the community, going to primary, singing the songs, seeing the pictures of the temple, uh, little boys knowing the steps you're climbing in the priesthood, little girls learning about modesty and thinking how your wedding dress is going to look. All very, very safe in the ordinary world of every Mormon child. And then comes the call to adventure. Did you ever look at it that way? 
those first feelings that you had that said, oh my gosh, I'm different. Oh my gosh, there's something unusual about the path that, that maybe I'm going to take in this world. I, 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 I don't like this. I don't fit. Maybe the little boys say, I'm, I'm, supposed, to, I'm supposed to like girls and I, and I like boys. And the little girls say, I'm supposed to like boys, but I like girls. Or most confusing of all, perhaps. I, I, I know that I'm a boy, but I'm trapped in this girl's body, or vice versa. Joseph Campbell says, Trouble shadows the home tribe. You hear it in the cries of our hungry children. Clearly, someone must go out beyond the familiar territory. A figure emerges from the campfire smoke, an elder of the home tribe pointing to you. Yes, you have been chosen as a seeker and called to begin a new quest. Well, what is the hunger of this tribe that might prompt such a call? Society, particularly our church, we know that not all is well in Zion. We know that there are many ills throughout the entire society. I have always remembered a statement by an actor that I like, Alan Alda, who spoke at his daughter's college graduation, and he said, our world suffers from testosterone poisoning. Now, I'm not equipped to say exactly the kinds of new visions that our gay people can bring back that the tribe needs. But I know very much that they are there. That somehow, many cultures look to their gay people as their shamans, as their healers, as their teachers. The Navajo speak of the, the two spirit. So what if there is some wisdom to this call to help heal the land? What if you, our hero, is called to help us see through new eyes this old and sometimes deeply troubled system of patriarchy? Step three, refusal of the call. And every gay person that I have ever known has refused the call. And I don't think that many people here, having heard those feelings of I'm different, say, oh, yay, 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 I'll go. Joseph Campbell says, gather your gear, fellow seeker. Some hesitate. Some are tugged at by families who fear for our lives. You hear people mutter that the journey is doomed from the start. Should you stay with the home tribe? Are you cut out to be a seeker? Everyone says, don't go, and everything in you says, don't go. And so, as we know, you make every, every effort not to be gay. All of the prayer, all of the scripture study, all of the fasting, the missionary work, the doing, what you're asked to do, 200%, the attempts at marriage, all of these things that say, I will not take that journey. Step four, meeting with the mentor, which is a wise old man or woman in mythology. So perhaps you, as the gay person, the gay hero, begins to study, to say, what is this thing I am experiencing? Maybe you listen to the podcast of uh, Bill Bradshaw on the biological origins of homosexuality. Maybe you speak to a therapist who wisely says, you know, this is your reality, and you can walk this path well. Or maybe you learn that your loved drama teacher or your loved choir director is a gay person, and wow, they're really a cool person. Joseph Campbell says, the shaman of the tribe presses something into your hand a magic gift that will guide us on the quest. Now we can set out with lighter hearts and greater confidence, for we take with us the collected wisdom 
of the home tribe. And perhaps we remember that our people were Mormon pioneers and can serve as mentors to us along this journey. Step five, crossing the threshold. Maybe here is where you fall in love for the first time and have an emotional experience that changes you forever. The guardian of the threshold may hold up one hand saying stop and another saying come. And as Lee reminded us, here we have don't partake of the fruit, do partake of the fruit. Joseph Campbell says, there is no turning back now. The adventure has begun for good or ill. So with a leap of faith, you, our gay or lesbian or transgender hero, acknowledges that as part of my identity, certainly not all of it, but as part of it, I am. I do experience myself as a homosexual human being or as a transgender individual. Step six, encounter tests, allies, enemies. I think the word ally was on the website inviting you to this conference. Hopefully everyone in this hall is an ally, a friend to the gay people that we know. Joseph Campbell says that we seekers are in shock. This new world is so different from the home we've always known. Not only are the terrain and the local residents different, the rules of this place are strange as they can be. Different things are valued here. Strange creatures jump out at you. Think fast. Don't eat that. It could be poison. So here you figure out what does this mean to be a gay person? And as you have figured out, this can be very, very dangerous territory. And the pitfalls and the gullies and the brambles all along this journey, far too many get lost in. The possibility of associating with predators possibility of succumbing to addictions. We know that gay people sometimes are more susceptible to addictions to substance, addictions possibly to pornography. Feeling that maybe promiscuous sexual behavior is what a gay person gets or wants. So many possible invitations to behavior that can be physically and emotionally and spiritually incredibly damaging. And much of this, of course, is our fault, us being the home tribe, us being those who, to some measure, threw you outside of the circle of comfort where the wolves and the weather are very damaging. So here's where you figure out, who can I trust? What do I want to do? How do I want my life to look? Do I have to, and the gay person often has to reinvent the wheel. Certainly not as much as my former husband Gerald did in the 80s in San Francisco, in that very damaging time. But this is where you have to figure out. And as was suggested here by Lee, here's where a lot of people give up the idea of spirituality altogether and decide maybe God is not really my ally, if there is a God. Maybe God is my enemy because I've been told so much about what God thinks about me. That part of the journey is very, very challenging. Number seven, approach to the inmost cave, and then eight, the supreme ordeal. Joseph Campbell says, the seeker, Enter the inmost cave. The way grows narrow and dark. You must go alone on hands and knees and you feel the earth press close around you. You can hardly breathe. Suddenly you find yourself face to face with a towering figure, a menacing shadow composed of all your doubts and fears. It's death 
that now stares back at you. And this should surprise no one here. Most of the gay people that I hear from have at one time or another at least considered that suicide might be the best option for them. This is the crisis. Do I live or do I die? This is where all the doubts and fears and the demons that have been fed by all the dark and negative things that you have heard about yourself. Here's where the demons try to bring you to your end. I was given permission by my dear friend Connell O'Donovan to use his name as I just described briefly. His time with the Supreme Ordeal at a little out of the way place in Idaho where he alone with a tent, a Bible, and a shotgun after years of doing everything that all of you have done to refuse the call, spent the time reading and crying and sobbing and praying and saying, Dear God, if I am part of the plan, you must let me know soon. Because if I am not part of the plan, I will not be alive tomorrow morning. And Connell told me that he did have a most wonderful and personal, remarkable experience in which God told him that he is part of the plan and he is deeply loved. And to the great loss of my church, Connell, a year ago, was baptized in the Pacific Ocean into the United Church of Christ, where he told me they gave him an extravagant welcome. May the time come when my church might be able to do the same. Number nine, reward, seizing the sword. Joseph Campbell, we seekers look at one another with growing smiles. We faced death, tasted it, and let lived. Strangely quiet now in the leaping shadows. You remember those who didn't make it. And you notice something. You're changed. Part of you had died and something new has been born. But wait, we're not finished. Number 10, the road back. What? Back? Well, hmm. Joseph Campbell, wake up, seekers. Remember why we came out here in the first place. People back home are starving, and it's urgent that we load up our backpacks with food and treasure and head for home. Hmm, head for home. Got to think about that one, huh? Perhaps you can't be part, again, of the ordinary world as you were at the beginning. Of course you can't. Maybe you won't want to be physically part of it at all. But somehow or other, you will need to find a connection or at least peace with your Mormon community. The people back home need what you have to give them. Recently, I received an email from a a Relief Society president in California who told me she was giving a, a lesson to her Relief Society on, uh, from my book, No More Goodbyes, and I asked her to get, let me know how it went. She wrote and said it was wonderful that people lined up to, to, to speak to her afterwards, to thank her, and that the stake young woman's president wrote to her and said, oh, how we need to that, and I, I, may we talk to you more. We have so many questions in our stake about this. So you know, as I know, that our tribe is starving for information on this, starving for a way to expand their understanding and their love. Step 11, resurrection. Joseph Campbell. You must undergo one final sacrifice before rejoining the tribe. Your warrior self must die so you can be reborn as an innocent into the group. The trick is to keep the wisdom of the ordeal while getting rid of its bad effects. Wow, we could talk about that for a long time. To me, it suggests something like, something like 
refusing to live a life of bitterness, something about forgiving, something about packing the handcart with the precious things and throwing away those things that are not precious to you, but finding peace of mind with your family and with your community, perhaps being an activist in a positive and not a negative kind of way, which we can do, brothers and sisters, because number 12, we have returned with the elixir. And so what is the elixir here? Joseph Campbell, we seekers come home at last, purged, purified, and bearing the fruits of our journey. We share the nourishment and treasure among the home tribe. A circle has been closed. You can feel it. You can see that our struggles on the road of heroes have brought new light to our land. And as it ends, it brings deep healing, wellness, and wholeness to our world. The seekers have come home. Home. And here we have the chance to relate anew to our family, to our Mormon community, because indeed we have the elixir. And you remember back in My Turn on Earth, Barbara and her friends, they were on a treasure hunt and they found the treasure, also called the elixir, and they said, Love, that's what it is. Oh, I found it because I love you and I love you and I love you. So for our journey, we have found the elixir, that substance capable of curing all ills. And for our gay heroes, it will not look exactly the same for each one. For many, it will be the warmth and the love of a committed relationship with the choice of your heart. And perhaps you too will at some point sing that little verse. Through the crash of the waves, I could tell that the words were romantic, something about sharing, something about always. I look at the couples that I talk about in No More Goodbyes, and I have seen so many of them since, and I am thrilled at the love and the kindness that I see between them. Sokoki and Richard, Brett and Jeff, Guy and Trey, and a wonderful lesbian couple, Pat and Chris. That is one splendid form of the elixir of love, and there are others. I had in my home, and I have corresponded with an older man who put away his homosexual feelings for many, many years, had a number of children, grandchildren, felt he could not do it any longer, divorced his wife, spent two or three years trying to find himself in the gay world, did not satisfactorily find a life there, and uh, wrote to me just few weeks ago. My wife and I are working at rebuilding our relationship and hope to get married again in the near future. We have always had a strong love for each other, but now I realize I can move forward with my life the way I feel it will bring me the most joy and happiness and most important peace of mind. Now his decision is one that I can honor, and I know that the love that he shares with his wife acknowledging that he is a homosexual man is one that for him is a choice that will bring him a great deal of peace of mind, and I do honor that. Some of our gay people will choose to stay with the church's requirements all their life to live a life of celibacy. My dear friend Mitch Main, who has had a lot of press these days, being an openly gay man who has been put into a, a, a bishopric in a ward in San Francisco, making it clear that he is not certain that that will be his entire journey, that he hopes in the future sometime to be able to have a partner. At this moment, Mitch is having the time of his life in the church, welcoming gay people who have become inactive in the church and want the fellowship in San Francisco. So there are various manifestations of this elixir of joy, which is something that we will all find as we complete the hero's journey. So, dear brothers and sisters, the curtain is up for your story. 
May you write it well. May you live it well. The tribe needs you. Do not let us down. You are our heroes. God bless. Thank you.
This podcast was brought to you today by Mormon Stories Podcast and by the Open Stories Foundation. To learn more about LDS homosexuality, check us out at ldshomosexuality.com. Music on today's podcast was brought to you by the Saber Rattlers. Take care. Sounding to us and each nation, and shortly the hour of redemption will come. When all that was promised, the saints will be given, and none will molest them from morn until evening. And earth will appear as the garden of Eden And Jesus will say to all Israel